Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to take an in-depth look at what a career in parapsychology could be. And I'm very pleased to be with my old friend, Dr. Marilyn Schlitz, who has had a stellar career in parapsychology. Marilyn is the President Emeritus of the Institute of Noetic Sciences in Petaluma, California. She is a professor and chair of transpersonal psychology at Sophia University in Northern California. She is co-author of Consciousness and Healing, Integral Approaches to Mind-Body Medicine. And she is also co-author of Living Deeply, The Art and Science of Transformation in Everyday Life, and co-author of Worldview Explorations. She is also co-producer with Deepak Chopra of the film Death Makes Life Possible, Transforming the Fear of Death into an Inspiration for Living. Marilyn lives in Northern California, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Marilyn. What a pleasure to be with you once again. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's my pleasure. I remember the days when uh, we had offices around the corner from each other at the Institute of Noetic Science. Yeah, that was a blissful period, huh? And we had new dimensions right there. It was great. Yeah, many, many years ago. Yeah, we go back a long time, Jeffrey. <laughs> In fact, now that I think about it, I believe I recall the first time I ever saw you, which was at the Parapsychological Association Convention at St. Mary's College, I think in Orinda, California, back in around 1980. Yeah, that could be. I did my very first presentation in 1979, and that was at Sonoma State. So, we've both been involved with this field for many, many decades. And uh, let's go back to the beginning, because I, if I recall correctly, you were a graduate student when you developed an interest in uh, researching parapsychology. I was actually an undergrad, and uh, I had been exposed to some really wonderful uh, scholarship. And I went to Wayne State University in downtown Detroit. And I discovered two books that literally changed my life. Uh, the first we know is Thomas Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And that said to me that we live in a paradigm and that paradigm shifts. And so at that point, I was really struggling as a, a kid in Detroit, where there was so much conflict and so much turmoil, and I wanted to make an impact, but I, I felt very disempowered to do anything, really impotent. And when I read that book, it was like, wow, well, maybe what's happening right now isn't permanent or fixed, and maybe we can change it. So that was the first step. And then I um, discovered that, uh, you know, I wanted to be on the cusp of a paradigm shift. You know, that was really a fascinating idea for me. And I uh, then discovered the book uh, Psychic Exploration by Edgar Mitchell, the Apollo 14 astronaut. And that book really set me on an odyssey. I knew that uh, the paradigm shift I was aiming for was really this idea of consciousness and the expanded reaches of our human potential. And that just led me on an odyssey. Well, it was a very important book. It was an anthology, if I recall, with more than a dozen contributors, uh, largely focusing in on parapsychology and making a very strong case that uh, the empirical data was, uh, I am tempted to say overwhelming, but maybe that's a little too strong a word. Compelling. Compelling. Com very compelling. <laughs> 
Yeah, and it was more authors than that. And they also had philosophers. And, you know, it said to me that there was serious scholarship and serious scientific work going into this idea. And, you know, I just wanted to be part of that. So what did you do next? Well, I was... uh, Taking psychology and the lesson I remember was very behaviorist and mechanistic and we are nothing more than. And I remember being a little adversarial with the professor. And then one day I ran into him in the parking lot and I told him about my interest in this topic and he he was really excited. It turns out he himself had a strong interest. And I was like, wow, that's a surprise. So I, at that point, I've always been interested in healing, but he gave me Targum Putoff's book, um, uh, Mind Reach. And we decided to start doing experiments together in remote viewing. So that's what I did. I did a summer internship uh, focusing on remote viewing. And it was all very preliminary, very exploratory. But what we discovered is we were getting really striking hits when the outbound experimenter would visit a place. And, you know, one of us described it with remarkable accuracy. So there was no attempt to do a objective judging at that point. We were really dabbling. Uh, and then one day we brought in a psychic and uh, she basically didn't really get anything. And I was the inbound and Charlie came back and he said, his name is Charlie Soli, Charles Soli. And uh, he came back and we interviewed her about her experience. And then he said to me, well, what did you get? And I said, well, I'm the experimenter and I'm objective. I, I didn't get anything. And he said, you must have seen something. And I'm like, well, this one image came into my mind and it was the Omega symbol from, you know, the Greek letters. And he got really excited about this. And we went to where he had been visiting and it was a building uh, surrounded by a moat. And there was a fence around the moat that was uh, these omega symbols. And then etched in concrete on the side of the building was a huge omega symbol. And so both of us kind of went, wow, that's pretty cool. (laughs) And, you know, that really got me going. And then from there, um, you know, at that point, the Parapsychology Foundation had published a list of all the places you could go to study parapsychology. And one of them was at the University of California in Irvine, and Robert Morris was teaching there. And I was like, you know, I'm going to go. And so I finished my last year of my undergrad in California, and I learned to do experimental parapsychology. I performed my first formal study where we looked at testing the claim made by Targan Putoff that any person can do this kind of thing. And uh, we had an objective judging. George Hansen at that time was the judge and Stephanie Deacon was my co-experimenter. And we were all very excited about everything. It was all fresh and new. And uh, we ended up getting significant results. And that was my first paper, first presentation, first publication in 1979. Were you then in uh, at Irvine, or were you still at Wayne? I had gone to Irvine. The school I was in, it was called Monteith College and at Wayne State University. And it was one of those intensive, high-ratio professors to students. And I think they just discovered it was too expensive for them. So uh, that's they decided to fade up, phase out the, the college, actually, is what happened. And so I was able to do my last year in an independent study way. So I went and studied with Bob and, you know, got to know some of the people that ended up moving forward in the field and got to really know him. And, you know, he became a beloved friend for many years beyond that. Bob Morris was a professor of mine as well, although I was at Berkeley around the same time. Was he at Berkeley? Well, no, but he was part of the University of California system. And I was involved in an independent 
uh, individual doctoral program, which enabled me to draw on uh, the entire University of California system. So uh, Bob was on my committee for a few years, but when I veered off and began doing a, a field study uh, project with a uh, UFO contactee, he dropped out. He said he didn't want to have anything to do with that. Yeah, I learned that from him, you know, kind of strict boundaries. Like if you're going to tackle a controversial topic, you know, stay with the rigor and the discernment and not be speculative. And I, I've held to that, although, you know, I, I have branched out in, in other ways over, over the years. Now, I know at some point, and I, I don't know the entire sequence of events in your life, but you uh, got the uh, Thomas Welton Stanford Fellowship at Stanford University, and I presume it wasn't too long after uh, doing the remote viewing work. That was actually quite a long time after. So what happened is, uh, with Bob's help, I got uh, summer internship at the Institute for Parapsychology in Durham, North Carolina. And I had applied to the LA Art School for photography. I got in there and I also got into the Rhine program. And I was like, you know, I really wanted to get out of LA. So I um, got in my car and drove across the country and uh, ended up having a just enchanting summer that would have been um, 1979. And then they gave me a fellowship. So I was there from 79 to 82. And it was during that time that we did a couple more formal remote viewing experiments. And uh, one was a uh, long distance to Europe. So it was between the US and Italy. And I had a colleague who went out and selected different locations. He selected 40 places. And then on each day of 10 days, he would randomly select a picture from the target pool. And I was actually the remote viewer in that experiment. And we found that there were striking correspondences. Uh, we had a team of five judges who independently went out and um, evaluated each transcript compared to the geographical location. And we ended up getting six direct hits out of 10. And that was strikingly significant statistically. So that became, you know, kind of a, a flagship project. I got a lot of visibility as a result of that. And I was still really, you know, young and uh, just graduated from my undergrad, hadn't started graduate school yet. And then we decided to do a replication, which I did with Joe Marie Haight. And that was between North Carolina and Florida. And again, we found statistically significant support for the remote viewing hypothesis. So I ended up having a really nice, strong beginning, a you know, very sturdy foundation. Uh, and while I was at the Rhine Center, I also, I really became interested in like medical anthropology and understanding psychic healing. And, you know, I wanted some kind of application for, you know, these, these ideas. And so I started working with um, Jim Davis and Jim Kennedy, both of them were there at the Rhine Center. And uh, we did my first psychic healing experiment where we worked with mice who had been anesthetized. It was a kind of conceptual replication of the Watkins and Watkins original work. And so we had these photo cells and we had video cameras above them and we would take two matched mice and put them on these photo cells with the cameras. And at random, in a random sequence, the cameras were turned on. And meanwhile, we had some doctors, some nurses, and myself and K. Ramakrishna Rao participated as, as you know, what we called subjects back then. It's participants now. And um, none of the health professionals did well. So what we were measuring is the the rate of resuscitation of these anesthetized mice. And so you could compare the arousal rate of the treated or intended for mouse compared to the control mouse. But when uh, Ramakrishna Rao and I did the experiment together, and we did it in a formal way, we actually published this, um, we got significant differences in the mice. So once again, 
it suggested to me that, you know, the experimenters are something more than just objective others in the context of a research project. Um, and so I was doing that and I got more and more interested in the idea of psychic healing. And I really wanted to um, study it in a more systematic way. And I found my way to William Broad at the Mind Science Foundation. And we began a series of experiments together where we were looking at a well-controlled paradigm for uh, looking at human arousal. So I didn't want to work with animals anymore. That was my one and only animal study. We'll never do another one. Um, so in this case, we were working with humans. And that research involved um, measuring the autonomic nervous system activity of a person in a shielded room, and then another person in another room intending to influence their physiology at random times throughout the the testing period. And we had it counterbalanced and controlled so that um, any kind of systematic error would be caught in both conditions. And we were able then to average the physiological activity during the intention periods as compared to the control periods in a within subject uh, condition. And we found out of 14 formal experiments over 10 years uh, that we had a highly significant difference. And what that said to us was that there was kind of a proof of principle around this idea of psychic healing. Um, and that was very exciting. It was great. I also got to work with Helmut Schmidt while I was there. And we did a couple of experiments looking at random event generators and what kinds of populations would produce the strongest results. And what we found when we looked at meditators, martial artists, uh, they showed the strongest effect in the um, PK experiments and to a statistically significant degree. So it was a very dynamic, productive period in my life um, during that time in San Antonio. And I learned a lot and really was privileged to be in the company of William Broad and Helmut Schmidt. And then one day they decided to discontinue the in-house research program and I had, uh, by this time I was in graduate school, I was uh, doing my PhD at the University of Texas in Austin, and I had been studying healers in the West Indies, my PhD is in anthropology, and, um, and so I remember going to a conference, it was a parapsychological association conference in Germany, and I remember Dick Bierman asking me, well, what are you going to do next? And I thought, well, whatever it is, I hope I can't envision it from this vantage point. And uh, I hadn't finished my dissertation yet. I didn't have a job. I was in a relationship that wasn't working. And it was like, well, what am I going to do next? And within a week, the phone rang. And it was Ed May from um, the remote viewing program and the CIA DIA project. And he, I said to him something like, well, how's your lovely wife? And he said, my lovely wife thinks I should hire you. <laughs> <laughs> and so I ended up going out to California and I knew that, um, the pull to San Antonio was really strong, so it was hard for me to leave there. And yet I, you know, obviously had to, and I had this really interesting job ahead of me, but somehow it wasn't enough. And I knew about this endowed chair at Stanford University, and I thought, wow, wouldn't that be great? So I raced to finish my dissertation, got that all defended and wrapped up, which was wonderful, and... Um, and I went to Stanford and I presented my idea to Roger Shepard, who was at that point the chair of this chair. He was in charge of that project. And keep in mind that this um, this chair, the Thomas Welton Stanford Psychical Research Chair, uh, was only given to skeptics. And you know, I knew this. I, I knew because I had applied for a gig at um, 
at Cambridge. And I came in on the short list and the person they ultimately picked was a skeptic. And I thought, okay, I can play that game too. So I proposed to do, I had done psycholinguistics for my uh, dissertation method. So I said to Roger Shepard, um, what about doing a discourse analysis of controversial science and look specifically at the skeptic proponent debate in parapsychology and try to understand the nature of truth construction in these controversial areas? Well, he loved it. He thought it was great. So he set me up for a job talk at Stanford, and it was some graduate students and faculty and uh, I was particularly focused on the Gonsfeld at that time. And because there was a lot of research going on around the Gonsfeld and um, a lot of debate, you know, Charles Onerton and Ray Hyman had been doing these formal debates in the literature. And uh, I thought, well, this is a you know, really interesting area to focus on. So I remember going in totally ready. You know, I a young, just graduated PhD, and um, I was pretty self-assured, I guess. And um, I was all ready to give my presentation, and I was beginning to uh, speak. And all of a sudden, this man came in, and he sat down, and he started bombarding me with questions. And it completely threw me off my script. And I ended up feeling, you know, really confident that I could engage him. Well, it turns out it was Lee Ross, who is a, a social psychologist at Stanford, who was very interested in parapsychology, but from a you know, fairly skeptical point of view, very close friends with Daryl Baum. And uh, so he, after the time was up, he stood up. He said, this is a very important project. It should be done. And he walked out <laughs> of the room. And I was like, who was that masked man? <laughs> and I ended up working with him at Stanford for a couple of years. And that was just a, a marvelous experience. So that's a long answer to your question about that, that job. Let's go back for a second to your uh, dissertation. It was in anthropology, and I think you mentioned psycholinguistics was a feature of it. So my dissertation, I, I wanted to play it straight. You know, I, um, I had really immersed myself in parapsychology at that point, and I wanted to have a kind of backup. And so I wanted to do a fairly mainstream, you know, kind of dissertation. I went to a mainstream school. Uh, and so in this case, I, I was working with a professor named Greg Urban, who ended up with one of the Templeton Genius Awards after that. He, he's a phenomenal guy. And uh, so I wanted to, you know, obviously work in a different culture. And I got a teaching job in the Virgin Islands. And um, so I went there and it was a great job. It was teaching undergrads and I was able to do what's called cultural ecology. So it was a marine biology ecology program and I did the kind of land-based people part of it. And we also had the opportunity to go out, you know, on a um, sailboat every semester for a couple of weeks and everybody was scuba diving and so I did that for a couple of years, and I was trying to get funding for my research in St. Lucia, but instead I just couldn't get the funding. And so I decided in a pragmatic way that it was time to just wrap this thing up. And so I ended up focusing on the island where I was teaching, which was St. John in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And what I did is uh, ethno-historical study. I looked at power dynamics in the context of healthcare discourse on St. John and the Virgin Islands. And so I was able to do an ethno-historical study. I looked at from the time that the Virgin Islands became a U.S. territory all the way to then the present period. I was there during Hurricane Hugo, so I was able to really look at how people were responding in the context of healthcare. Um, the most interesting part of that project was uh, interviewing elders about the bush medicine, so the traditional healing practices. And I just found that whole process enchanting. Uh, I would put a tape recorder down in the middle of a table, and these elders would talk about their experiences with the bush. 
And and it was really a, a wonderful reflection, you know, a lot of nostalgia, a lot of um, uh, com- conversation around the climate change and how the bush that they used to collect wasn't available anymore. So they were starting to see the impact of, you know, the changes, not only from the environment, but also because St. John was being developed pretty quickly. Fortunately, it's it's a national park. Um, Lawrence Rockefeller actually bought the property and made it into a national park. So that was that was great because now it's kind of preserved. It's it's the most beautiful of the U.S. Virgin Islands for sure. Um, Anyway, so I looked at the ethno history of Western medicine as it related to the political issues. I looked at healthcare today in terms of allopathic. I looked at this kind of reflective uh, bush medicine piece. And then I looked at the introduction of complementary and alternative medicines into uh, the healthcare system there. So it was all looking at how people expressed their power or lack of power in the context of healthcare discourse. So, you know, I've never really done anything with that work. I got that job at SAIC right after the Stanford gig happened. And then, um, you know, then one day Ed lost his government contract and the phone rang and it was Wink Franklin at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And he asked me if I would like to come and be director of research at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And I wasn't sure I wanted to. Um, I was at Stanford at the time. I was like mainstream, you know, I could go for this. And then I realized I had never gone to graduate school to be a mainstream academician. I had gone because I wanted to be on the paradigm shift, you know, in the edge of this breakthrough. And so I took that job. Well, I think it's interesting in in many different ways. It's sort of a preparation for uh, a lot of further interests that you had in uh, psychic healing and uh, in, in the context of complementary medicine. It also... Uh, Reminds me of, uh, even though I think parapsychology in the 70s and 80s was an up-and-coming field, there was funding available maybe much more so than there is today, but nevertheless, most students were given the advice of make sure that you have some sort of mainstream credential that you can fall back on, always be, uh, in fact, the advice was often wait until you get tenure before you venture into parapsychology. And I imagine you were probably influenced by that kind of advice as well. That's really true. I wrote to Bob Morris. uh, No, I'm sorry, Charlie Tart. Charlie Tart was then a professor at the University of California in Davis. And uh, I knew him to be, you know, a leading, leading star in the field. And I wanted to get his input and Uh, actually a letter of recommendation when I was starting graduate school. And he wrote me that very thing you just said, which is, uh, first of all, don't do it. And secondly, if you do do it, make sure that you get a mainstream degree so that you've got something to back you up. And I really followed that advice. Uh, I thought it was very good advice, and I recommend it for many people. I, you know, had the opportunity. I could have gone to a, um, an alternative kind of school. Those existed, and that would have been very supportive. But, you know, I found the University of Texas at Austin to be incredibly supportive. I loved it. Uh, I loved medical anthropology and also, you know, the whole social anthropology piece, which has served me well in the years after. But, uh, yeah, it was you know, it's always like this delicate balance, you know, how far do we go into, you know, our pursuit of these sort of renegade ideas and how much do we try to stay safe and, you know, have a day job. Um, Fortunately for me, uh, I have to say that I have been privileged by being invited into the safe spaces throughout my entire career. You know, there have been these places where I could land and, and, and explore and, you know, all the way through from the time I went to Irvine to the Institute for Parapsychology, where they were very welcoming to me. Uh, the Mind Science Foundation was just one of those sweet places in the world where we were allowed to really explore these ideas and we didn't have to pursue funding. It was endowed. Um, 
And then, you know, Ed's work, Ed May's work at the Science Applications International Corporation, uh, he had the Cognitive Sciences Lab, and that's where I worked and did research with uh, Stephen LaBerge. And we can talk about that a little bit because that's a whole nother chapter. But and then, you know, I was at the Institute of Noetic Sciences for 25 years and I had to do a lot of fundraising, but it was really an honor to be there and to work with Edgar Mitchell, the Apollo 14 astronaut. It was kind of one of those ironies in life that Edgar's work was what catalyzed me into the field. And then I never applied for the job and it just came to me. And so, you know, that was fortuitous. I remember the day I had an office in those days at the Institute of Noetic Sciences because I had a, a grant to run a program called the Intuition Network. And, and we ran that grant through that institute. And I remember when Wake Franklin came up to me and said, what, what do you think of Marilyn Schlitt? Should we hire her? Yeah, I gave him a very strong recommendation, as, as a matter of fact. And uh, at the Institute, uh, I remember a lot of your focus was looking at complementary medicine because, if, if I remember correctly, the U.S. government had established an office uh, within uh, HEW or NIH at that time to look at uh, complementary medicine, and you thought that there might be some opportunities there uh, in connection with your work at Noetics. Well, that was true. Um, I think the first time I got invited to the NIH was right about that time. I think I might have still been at the Mind Science Foundation. I'd have to go back and look. But I was actually invited to be on the advisory panel for the Office of Alternative Medicine uh, and then at the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. So I sat on the integration panel, which is kind of at the highest level before they award the grants. And it was an extraordinary experience, you know, having access to the scientists, to a lot of funding at that time. Well, it seemed like a lot of funding. It wasn't relative to um, the other institutes. But uh, it still exists today. But I think it's kind of, you know, we were ready to charge forward. And there were a number of people on that integration panel who were very open-minded and wanted to explore, you know, all dimensions of complementary and alternative medicine. And gradually it became more and more reified, more, um, uh, what would be the word, more mature, I guess, or more conventional is probably a better word, uh, which is a bit of a shame. And I've kind of lost track of some of it. I was thinking about it yesterday that maybe I should do a little digging and see what's going on there. But yeah, it was, it was great. It was great. And I was able to convene um, symposium. I was able to work toward field formation in a variety of different areas. Uh, we looked at, you know, spontaneous healing. We looked at um, psychic healing. Uh, we were able to look at biofields and subtle energies. Uh, and, you know, I was able to raise funds uh, in order to administer a small grants program. And IONS had a, and still has, a very good uh, selection and collection of philanthropists who are open-minded enough to support this. And also on, along the way, and there's many tales to be told around all this, but um, we did get an NIH grant to study distant healing in a clinical setting. And so that's, you know, another another chapter. Well, if I remember correctly, you were working closely with Elizabeth Targ, the late Elizabeth Targ, on some of that research. And uh, I seem to remember several beautifully conducted double-blind experiments in uh, distant healing. That's true. Uh, she was a very close friend of mine, and uh, we worked closely. We spent a lot of energy putting together a center grant to study um, distant healing. And, oh, wow, there's so many stories to tell around that, you know, working through the night, trying to uh, get the data so that we had preliminary data in order to support the grant. And um, we ended up submitting it. 
We got top scores from the peer review process. And uh, at that time, the director of the National Center for Complementary Medicine really didn't like the idea that this group, this renegade group over here in California, got better scores than his buddies at Harvard and Duke and wherever else he was trying. University of Michigan was one of the areas. And uh, so he said, I don't accept it. I'm sending it back for re-review. Well, this is unprecedented. The program officers were like, wow, this does never, never happens. So he sent it back, and Gary Schwartz, also at the University of Arizona, our two center grants got the highest scores. And um, he sent it back for re-review. We ended up getting um, accepted. Again, we got the highest scores. (laughs) So, you know, just because we're doing alternative work doesn't mean we can't do good science. And in fact, I think we've had to do better science. We've had to be more rigorous in a lot of ways. Anyway, what happened then is, um, first of all, 9-11 happened and that stopped and paused everything. So we weren't able to move forward with the center grant, even though it, you know, was approved. And then Elizabeth got brain cancer. She had a glioblastoma. And so that was a very, very turbulent period and, you know, one of tremendous growth in terms of, you know, my own personal development and knowing, you know, the deep suffering and also that sense of gratitude that one can have such strong relationships and develop such collegiality and friendship. Uh, So she died six months later, almost to the day when they predicted. And so then things passed and it opened up at NIH. And then Steven Strauss was his name, um, decided that because, so the center grants operate where you have three projects and an educational program. So it's, it centers around kind of the education and the public thing with the research supporting it. And so one of them was Elizabeth's project, uh, one of them was mine, and one of them was Garrett Yance. And because Elizabeth died, he wouldn't allow us to replace her. And so we lost the center grant. And it was so heartbreaking for all kinds of reasons. You know, I mean, you can imagine it was just it was a painful, painful period. And then um, what happened is the program officers who really felt we'd gotten shafted and told me, I heard this from several of them, um, they decided to pull out. So instead of having Elizabeth's project, which ironically was about glioblastoma. So she was looking at psychic healing for patients who had glioblastoma and she ended up dying of that disease and The psychic healing did not help her. But what happened is um, Garrett's project got funded and then my project got funded. And Garrett was looking at Qigong and biofields. And I was looking at compassionate intention uh, for women undergoing breast surgery, so reconstructive surgery. And I chose that because I had a surgeon who was willing to play. And so we scheduled, you know, this clinical project. Um, And it was, uh, you know, several years of research. And we did end up finding a significant effect for a subgroup who had uh, had had breast cancer and were doing reconstructive surgery after. We didn't get a significant effect with the, the reconstructive surgery patients who were doing elective surgery. So it was kind of interesting. And I would say in terms of the whole history, you know, of this work, um, the D-Mills work that I did with William Broad uh, turned out to become a kind of classic paradigm for research and was then replicated in laboratories around the world. Uh, Meta-analyses have been done on it, and it shows that there is this kind of proof of principle. But the studies that have gone into a clinical setting to see if, you know, we can really improve health outcomes for people who are really sick um, has been very murky. Um, You know, I mean, I could go through some of those data, but 
it is not straightforward, clear that any of those studies were, you know, evidence of uh, a psychic healing effect. If we can jump back, you mentioned that you did work with Stephen LeBerge, uh, who is well known for his work in lucid dreaming. I interviewed him about that, I think, back in the 1980s, as I recall. So is that what you were working on, lucid dreaming? We're all so old now. (laughs) (laughs) No, we weren't doing that. Uh, Stephen came in as a psychophysiologist to support me on um, two studies that we did looking at uh, remote staring. So this idea was very similar to what I was working on with William. Um, In this case, we had people come in. There was a video camera on them, and another person in another room was sending intention. And the video camera would go on and off, um, and the person didn't know when they were being stared at and when they weren't. So the idea was to see if, again, uh, if you average the physiological activity of the participants and then you look at that activity in two different conditions, staring and not staring, uh, you're able to then do statistics on that. And so uh, we did that and we got two studies that showed significant differences in the physiology of the people when they were being stared at by a person in another room uh, through closed circuit television and under a randomized sequence. So that was um, that was basically the work I did at, at the Cognitive Sciences Lab at SAIC. And then when um, I moved over to the Institute of Noetic Sciences, I got involved in a potential collaboration with uh, Richard Wiseman. And Richard and I had met and we have good rapport and it was a nice convivial relationship. So he's, you know, a card carrying member of the skeptical community as well as a professional magician and a, you know, clinical psychologist, or I guess he's a social psychologist. Um, And I think he really was interested in trying to catch me in a trap, you know, I think if if we were going to be really honest about it. But he said, well, why don't we collaborate? So I went to his lab and we did uh, one like informal experiment. In fact, it was for a film crew that had come in to document this. And um, when he was doing. Oh, okay, So in that experiment, We had two experimenters, Richard and myself, and we um, then trying to remember, did we do the steering? No, I think we didn't. We had people come in and do the steering, but I worked with half the people. He worked with half the people. So it was the same subject population, the same equipment set up, the same randomization sequence, all of that was identical. Um, So again, if there were any kind of systematic errors in the protocol, it should show up in both of our data sets. And what we found uh, first in this very preliminary exploratory thing was a very significant difference in the physiological activity for my participants and not for his. So this was kind of probably disturbing for him, I'm going to say. Um, you know, he he had never had a significant study in his lab, didn't really want to have a significant study in his lab. Uh, and I say this in all um, goodwill. Uh, you know, I have great respect and fondness for Richard. So anyway, we then decided to do a formal experiment together and, uh, you know, pre-specified how many participants and the whole thing. And in the end... My my population showed a significant difference in physiology when being stared at as compared to the con- control conditions, and his did not. And so this was really interesting. And I go back to my time at Wayne State University where the psychic didn't produce anything, but the experimenter did, uh, to my time at the Rhine Center where the people who popped out as good you know, psychics were the experimenters. And so here we are in this situation where we've got two, you know, objective scientists um, having kind of different worldviews and predispositions toward what would happen. Anyway, I got a significant difference and he didn't. So then, of course, this 
called for replication. And we uh, then I set up a lab. There was no lab at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Never had been until I got there. Um, and so we set up this little lab. And we did the same experiment, uh, but this time in California instead of England, because that's where he's from. And we again found that we had replicated our initial findings. So I'm batting four for not, and he's batting four for not, but in the opposite directions. So again, this speaks to this question of objectivity in science and how removed is an experimenter in the context of you know, their lived experience. So, so that was fascinating. We ended up doing a third study together that was much more complicated, uh, crossover designs. And we, we looked at ourselves as the, the starers. And in that study, we, we found some interesting sort of secondary effects, but overall the, the study wasn't significant. And, you know, one can say, well, you know, there's a natural, um, there's a natural progression in terms of research that you don't expect significance in every experiment. It's more about amassing them in the context of a meta-analysis. And the meta-analysis uh, shows a highly significant difference. Uh, so that's that's interesting. But it also speaks to um, my fatigue. I just I was done. I didn't, did not want to do any more of those experiments. I had to sit in this little cubicle and stare at this television monitor. And, you know, it was all well and good at the beginning. But then, you know, after the 99th trial, it was like, oh, my God, I can't do this anymore. So that's how that wrapped up. And uh, I still to this day have a very good relationship with him. Uh, I don't believe he's doing any more psi experiments and um you know, that was kind of another chapter. I think that that study with Richard Wiseman is probably your most famous experiment. I hear people uh, citing it all the time because it was such clear evidence that the experimenter attitude can affect the data. Yeah, I mean, I think I've had, you know, the privilege of several highlights. And certainly the original remote viewing work I did um, I remember Hal Putoff telling me that my first study saved their program because the uh, program officers saw that there was an independent person um, who was able to replicate this. And so they ended up getting a renewal of their contract. So that was very nice to know. Uh, I did a project with the Juilliard students, with Chuck Onerton using the Gonsfeld. And that got a lot of... Uh, visibility because it produced highly significant results with a particularly interesting population. It was the last Gonsfeld experiment that was done at Chuck's lab because that closed down. Uh, and then this D-mill stuff, and I think, you know, the work with Wiseman, also because from a sociological point of view, it's not common for people of opposing positions to collaborate. And for me, I think it's a natural, as long as you can do it with integrity and goodwill. And and we had great goodwill. There was a lot of laughter, a lot of joking. Richard's hilarious. You know, we had a lot of fun. Dean Radin was part of that project. He's funny. You know, so there was a lot of humor and a lot of, um, you know, playfulness, as well as then the serious work that we did. And then, you know, I hope I've had some other victories along the way. Well, I think part of what made that research significant is that uh, Richard Weissman, who was well known as a skeptic, published and he said in, in my laboratory with a different experimenter, not me, we got positive data. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating it stories really well. You know, I mean, you can see it and people can kind of grok that this is really an interesting discovery. And then the whole idea that we could be fundamentally challenging one of the cornerstones of science, which is objectivity. And to see that we were able to do these studies in the way that we did, uh, I think it really got a lot of people interested.
And I think it's also very interesting that although Richard is identified as a prominent member of the so-called skeptical community, he, he does make an effort to be objective about it. He doesn't seem like such a partisan participant. And in, in fact, if I recall correctly, he did his doctoral work under Bob Morris at Edinburgh. And he's now married to Carolyn Watt, who is the professor in that position at the University of Edinburgh. So it, it shows that uh, the possibility of skeptics and proponents of parapsychological phenomena can work together. And should work together. I think it, it really shows. When I got the job at Stanford, um, I had two letters of recommendation, and one came from Daryl Bem who's well known to be a proponent. And one came from um, uh, Ray Hyman, who is a well-known skeptic. And I think when they looked at that and thought, wow, you know, this person can get strong reviews and, and uh, recommendations from these different kind of camps, uh, that spoke well for the possibility that I could do something useful. It's interesting that you bring up Ray Hyman, because now that I think about it, he was at the uh, Parapsychological Conference in 1980, where uh, I first uh, encountered you. And I happened to interview him at that time, and he talked about how impressed he was with the rigor that the parapsychologists were applying to their research. He said, most skeptics have no idea how serious this work is. And uh, so he then went and uh, arranged for that interview of uh, him speaking so positively about parapsychology to have it published in the Skeptical Inquirer and then republished again in uh, one of his own books, which was overall skeptical about parapsychology. But he felt if you want to be skeptical, uh, let's at least be honest about it and not accuse the parapsychologists of, of being uh, sloppy researchers because they're not. In today's political climate where things have become so polarized, you can see that in the parapsychology discourse that, you know, there are the proponents who believe and there are the skeptics who doubt. And there's very few in the middle who can, you know, play between those edges. And I've always you know, wanted to uh, be part of what I think is a very honest way of approaching the field. Well, I think anybody who looks closely at the data, as you have done, and as you just expressed with regard to the all the, the data that's accumulated on psychic healing, it can be very convoluted and uh, you know, the early work in psychic healing by Bernard Grad at McGill University seem pretty clear cut. This stuff really works. But after decades of uh, doing studies and getting positive results, you are honest enough to say the, the data is still confusing. Well, I think the DMIL stuff, the work that's done in a laboratory setting, is really compelling. I mean, I has been done in independent laboratories under very well controlled circumstances with a number of different researchers and subjected to a very rigorous meta analyses. They, they pulled out the straight D mills work and then the remote staring work uh, did meta analyses. Uh, Stefan Schmidt did the meta analysis in Germany at the Freiburg Institute and uh, published in a mainstream journal. Um, Richard and I published in a mainstream journal. We, we published in, um, uh, I don't know, one of the British psychology, you know, mainstream journals. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's not a clear cut path, but I think if you look at most areas of research, that is also true. You know, they, um, in mainstream psychology, for example, it's been very controversial. Some of the most hallowed and, um, you know, uh, established principles in mainstream psychology have not truly been subjected to replication, in which case then you don't really know. So 
I know that Jonathan Schooler, who's at the University of California in Santa Barbara, was doing some research to look at um, some of these mainstream ideas. And he had this very interesting protocol set up where he had researchers who had a particular idea, and then he had a team of other researchers who also had their own ideas, but everybody was then replicating each other's work. And the idea was to look at a decline effect. So do you see a natural decline effect in, you know, these uh, mainstream psychological paradigms? And I don't know where that research stands today or whether it's ever been completed. It was a pretty complicated study. Well, I know that uh, a lot of mainstream psychology is being called into question right now. The uh, buzzword is QRP, questionable research practices, as I recall. So surely that makes parapsychology, which is controversial among psychologists, even more controversial as a result of that. But going back to your DMILS work, DMILS stands for Distant Mental Influence on Living systems. Uh, it's a little bit different than a healing study, I gather, uh, because you're not necessarily looking at uh, people who are ill and have uh, pathologies that need to be healed. That's correct. So uh, only one time we, we looked at people with hyperactivity and we attempted to calm them and that produced a significant effect. I think there's something about that need, you know, and you see it also in my clinical trial on uh, compassionate intention that, um, you know, that showed up in the group of people who had had cancer. And so they had a need to be healed. So it may be that, um, you know, there's something in the complexity of the healing process that needs to be factored in. And the other thing I want to say is, you know, in the field of consciousness generally, which, you know, I'm very interested in and follow pretty avidly, um, you know, we're complex. And, the idea of consciousness as something more than the brain is a complex notion. And then when you begin to think, well, perhaps all living systems are conscious and maybe we're all part of an interconnected relationship. So it's no wonder that these, you know, isolated, randomized, controlled trials may not be as straightforward as we'd like them to be. Also, I recall uh, one time uh, there was a healing finding. It used to be called the brown thumb effect, as I recall, healing on plants where uh, individuals who were depressed uh, had a negative effect on, on the uh, plants they were endeavoring to heal. So the uh, state of the healer varies, of course, from uh, day to day or year to year, and, and that will affect uh, the results you get. And I think that, you know, we do have to look at not all of the research was conducted equally well or under, you know, the kinds of controls that the mainstream would want to see. And I know, for example, I did a project on um, the germination of seeds. And that was something that, you know, people were talking about at that period in time. And and what I ended up finding is there was an artifact in the protocol that the seedlings that didn't grow were the ones on the outside, randomized to be on the outside of the, um, the dish that held the little uh, plants. So I think people need to look at alternative explanations. You know, I'm a professor at Sophia University now, and I have a lot of graduate students. And fundamental to all their research projects is the requirement that they, they look at, well, you know, what could be an alternative explanation? And I just think that's, that's healthy. Well, looking back over the many decades of your career, Marilyn, uh, you certainly done a lot of important work in the field. At the same time, I get the impression that opportunities for people in parapsychology these days are very different from uh, what they were like uh, when you and I were coming of age. And I, I wonder, uh, what kind of advice do you give the, today to young people who are interested in going into parapsychology? psychology? Well, I would say that it seems as though what you just said is true in the United States, but not true in Europe. 
And in Europe, there seems to be quite a bit of activity. And there is even some government support for research. And uh, people are doing really innovative things. So um, I organized a panel at the last Parapsychological Association on the psychomantium. And that's my current research interest is this idea of um, gazing into a reflective surface and then giving yourself the invitation to um, invite your creative imagination to engage with invisible others. And it's a it's an approach that we're using uh, to reduce grief and suffering in people who have lost a loved one. Um, and so I had this panel and uh, a couple of the people were from Europe and they were doing stuff that, you know, was very far out and yet was um, supported because it was, you know, the freedom to think and the freedom to do and that there shouldn't be these kind of restrictions on what are acceptable questions for the research community. So what would I advise? I would advise what Charlie Tart advised me to do, which is get a mainstream degree. Um, make sure that you've got your um, yourself covered if you need a meal ticket. And parapsychology isn't necessarily the best ticket to go on. On the other hand, there are things like alternative healing. Um, there's a lot of interest in psychology and things like post-traumatic stress disorder. Can you bring some of these principles of psi research or biofields? You know, this biofield, subtle energy field is, is percolating up. Um, so there may be opportunities within the NIH, for example, to get funding for some of this work. Obviously, you know, you have to work extra hard at it. You need to have pilot data in order to justify uh, the study. But I think that, you know, trying to do some kind of mainstream research, even if it has a twist to it, um, gives you a backup plan. Well, Marilyn Schlitz, this has been a delightful conversation. You have had a very storied career in parapsychology, and I know that you have many other interests uh, to boot, which makes, I think, your work in parapsychology even stronger. I uh, am delighted to have had this conversation with you and to be able to share it with our viewers. I hope it inspires some young people to uh, move into the field, and uh, I look forward forward to future conversations with you. I think we have a lot more to talk about. Well, it's an evolving process, and I just so appreciate all you've done to help document and chronicle, and, you know, congratulations on the Bigelow Prize. You deserve it, and uh, I, I appreciate the time today. Thank you. It's my pleasure, and for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us. Thank you.